Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is kind of, we're now halfway through the midpoint of our current webinar series. Um, but don't despair, we might have a couple of bonus webinars for you. I think one of which we're going to announce today, which is um, on the new Skypool. So hopefully you'll have seen um, on social media that the Skypool, there's, um, there's a new video that's been released to its lifting. It's a fantastic video, so I recommend you watch that. Uh, Google that and watch that. But um, we will have a webinar coming up shortly after its um, launch date of the 19th of May. So watch this space for that one. It's gonna be very exciting um, for that project. Uh, but today, we are going to be focusing on La Reference in Haiti, um, which has given me great pleasure. I've seen the presentation already and the, the smiles on the children's faces are just fantastic and very different to the UK children, I imagine. But um, it, it is absolutely superb to see and um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, the project won the Ice Struck Tea Award uh, for sustainability in 2019 um, for its ingenuity and sustainability. and. For this webinar, we've got um, we've got two guest speakers joining us, and, and a bonus third one as well, as as you might be able to tell, um, uh, and a bit later on. Um, so our two guest speakers are Pierre Henri Opinel, um, who's the founding director of Studio PHH Architects, and he's got a long-standing connection with the relief work. Gregor Horsmeyer. Um, who used to work for Ecclesia Callahan, and this is how uh, the project came to be. Um, but he's now stepped back. Um, he's very kindly come back uh, to do this webinar, um, as he is now taking a bit of a sabbatical, a bit of a, a sideways thing from structural engineering uh, to work on a completely different venture, which is kind of producing innovative new wide shot uh, video microscopes, which sounds very interesting and very different. Um, but as if all of this wasn't enough, um, his wife had a baby a month ago and he is on um, and he is on looking after duty at the moment for unforeseen circumstances. That's fine. But that means that Georgia is our third guest speaker um, today as well. So um, she, she's going to be joining us um, for, for the thing. Oh, she's gorgeous. Um, so I will hand over uh, before before I've been distracted before I hand over. I'll just kind of uh, for. Our seasoned people, this will not come as any surprise, but for anybody who's new, there's a chat function up in the right hand side of your screen. So um, you can talk to us, say hello. Um, it's always nice for the presenters not to know that they are speaking to thin air. And you can put any questions up in the um, in the little chat in the questions function and you can give it a thumbs up if you like. And um, yeah, we'll take questions at the end. I'll reappear for that. Um, I will now hand over to Pierre. Thanks very much. Take care. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. So as Catherine mentioned, my name is Pierre Hopeno. Uh, I founded Studio PHH Architects about uh, five years ago. And uh, I will be presenting sort of the first half of the project, uh, architectural decision, this is how we chose to approach the construction and design for this project in Haiti. And then I will hand off to Gregor uh, to talk a little bit more about the, the construction process and um, and to discuss the structural strategies that we that we employed here. Um, of course, thank you to Ecrisy O'Callahan both for hosting the webinar series, but more importantly for taking this project on pro bono and following it through from the start to the end, which is just so so important. Um, for all the uh, all the kids and the professors that have poured their soul into the school. Um, so let's get started. Um, as Catherine mentioned, we we won the ISTRACTI Award for Sustainability in 2019, which is uh, just over a year ago, year and a half maybe. And since then, we actually won that award for phase one, which you'll see. We'll talk a little bit more about how the project was phased, uh, and the school has since tripled in size since winning that award. So that's that's very exciting. So you can see here, um, this is what it looks like today. Essentially, these pictures are just uh, a month or two old, uh, and you can see um, 
you can see what the, the school looks like now that phase two has been completed. Um, and before jumping into the presentation, I just want to say that the importance and, and timeliness of this project is, is really is not lost on me. When you consider the, the relevancy of children's education during COVID, uh, racial inequalities in education, and the political uncertainties and protests that are currently happening in Haiti, uh, this is a truly important project for, for all of the people that get to experience it day in and day out. What we've created here is, is truly important to that community. And what's most important is that it remains this stable and inspiring space for uh, these children to learn and uh, learn no matter what happens around them. And you can see them here wearing their masks. Um, COVID luckily was not hugely impactful in Haiti, but every precaution was taken and school continued and these kids' education are their future. So a uh, little bit about the team. So again, I'm a, the, I was the architect studio PHH, took on the project, uh, also pro bono. And I spent a lot of my career working on these very large educational projects before starting studio PHH. And being able to take some of those, uh, a lot of that research and the, the the spatial research about how do you create spaces that are uh, inspiring and innovative and putting them into this much smaller project was really a wonderful, uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, everyone on this webinar knows Eckersley O'Callaghan. So again, thank you for partnering with us on this. And then our construction team, JSC Construction, who were really wonderful partners throughout the process. If you are on this webinar because you're looking to work in Haiti, um, please reach out to me. I can put you in touch with them. They are in the Port-au-Prince area and they were great partners in a process that's difficult to manage from a distance. Um, the nonprofit Connected Princeton Haiti, uh, who sponsored the entirety of the project and uh, put together the team. And of course, last but not least, the founders of La Référence, um, who, are, who are a group of young men, essentially, six, I believe there's six of them, who just poured their soul into this project and uh, education as the future for their country. So you can see uh, this was during phase one under construction, one of our site visits. That's a lot of the people involved in the team, including construction as well as, uh, as some of the school teachers. So beginning with the site, <clears throat> this photo was taken in 2017. So before the project started and the school, the, the professors had actually purchased this lot. Um, and this was during our first site visit, I believe, where we went to meet with, with them to discuss what they were looking to create. Um, so the site's about an hour east of Port-au-Prince in a region and uh, a town called Gantier. And it's located between an orphanage on one side and the houses that you can see in this photo. Uh, it was a vacant lot. And most of the time, as happens in, in Haiti, those lots are used for all kinds of things. So it was full of construction materials. People were dumping trash there. But it was also simultaneously, as you can see in this photo, a place where children would come and play in the open space. So one of the things that jumped out at us um, was the fairly mature trees, which you can see here. Uh, if you know anything about Haiti and uh, some of the problems in the country, deforestation is one of the big ones. So when we saw this, we realized that the, the trees could and should become a central part of the project um, for, for uh, sustainab sustainability reasons, but also obviously reasons of, of comfort, being in the Haitian sun in the summer uh, is much nicer when you have this sort of natural cover. So you see here the 
site plan after these conversations with professors and um, a number of design iterations um, we decided to create this large central courtyard and the courtyards created through essentially these two l-shaped building that dovetail with the treetops and the tree canopies um, so this undulating rooftop reconnects with the trees adjacent and creates this really wonderful space in the center for uh, for the community and this idea that uh, the school is first and foremost a safe uh, community for these children to learn and this may come as a surprise but this was not an obvious solution for especially for haitian uh, construction, they typically put a big square building and put it in the middle of the site as far as possible from the edges. So this was actually, it took a, some conversations with the founders to make this uh, site plan make sense to them and they're really uh, enjoying it now. This is just a picture of the site and those trees and you can see phase one, uh, the first module and a half in the back there. So jumping into uh, some strategies and of course, some of the challenges of designing in Haiti. So from the start, our goal was very clear. Uh, we wanted to one, use local materials and the local workforce. Two, we wanted the project that we create to be a way to train this local workforce for future projects. And three, we didn't want to bring anything that was uh, out of context or out of their, their skill sets to the project. So we're using the very limited material palette that is inherently uh, available in Haiti and affordable in Haiti. And you can see some of that here. We'll touch more on that. Um, so in this image, you can see actually in the foreground at the bottom and on the right side of the image, that's the previous school. That's where they were teaching right next door to this lot. And in the background is the new school. What This is one of my favorite images. What I love about the image is you can see that we are actually using the exact same construction type with a corrugated metal roof. The windows, uh, they have very skilled welders in. Haiti, the windows are made in the exact same way that they would typically make theirs. And, and the whole structural system is reinforced masonry blocks. So we're, we're using uh, very local strategies to make something that is hopefully a little bit more special than uh, I, I guess I would say the typical construction there. And again, just a little bit of context for um, what is around the school. It's a lot of, uh, very poor children and the children in this photo could very well be going to the school right now. So that's, uh, that's always something important to remember is the context around the beautiful images that we're showing. This is the best place uh, and the best moment in the day for these kids. So <clears throat> our strategy, um, of, I guess I would say a fundamental aspect of the design from the onset was using the idea of phasing and modularity um, to be able to troubleshoot any issues. So um, given the limited funds and we had no illusion that building in Haiti would be easy, um, we decided to have a first phase, which you can see highlighted uh, with the green roof there. That would be sort of a, a test or a pilot phase for the rest of the project to make sure that we could do it successfully on budget, on time. Um, so we use this as an opportunity for ourselves to learn what uh, building in Haiti might look like, but also for the contractor to learn how to read our drawings, to answer any questions that they had and, and adjust uh, as needed on both sides, honestly, it was a true conversation back and forth. So here you can see um, the first module and a half. 
and sort of a, a phasing plan. I believe this drawing was in the structural set, um, but a phasing plan for how this roof, fairly complex roof, might get put together. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of means and methods and communication. But um, this first phase really allowed us to uh, troubleshoot a number of issues, and we encountered many, which Gregor uh, will touch on a little bit. The second phase, start to finish, basically without any trouble. So I think it was a very successful way to handle this type of project. <clears throat> um, so you can see here the, the school phase one in the background, phase two to the right. Um, again, in terms of trying to be efficient with uh, the budget, materials, etc., from the start, we decided that the structural system and the architectural uh, expression of the school should be completely linked. Um, so the, the repetition of the CMU peers, which you can see in white, that's the structure is based on, um, on the size of a CMU block. And the openings between those, which grow from three CMU blocks to two and a half to two to one and a half to one, uh, the entire school is based around this module, the small module uh, that we could then repeat and reuse in order to uh, solve the structure and create an identity for the school. So the openings between the, the piers, which you can see here, going from small on the left to large on the right, that's the, the door to the classroom typically. Um, those were used for uh, natural ventilation, very important in a country that's this high. You can see a lot of air was actually brought in through the roof openings as well on the second floor. Um, and also to provide natural light so that there was very good light on uh, the, the reading surface for, for children. If you look at the doors, you can see that masonry block module continuing across the doors. So uh, again, taking that, that block and actually applying it as a pattern across these uh, welded steel doors. And, you know, maybe you, you, if you look at it with the trees in the background, maybe it feels like you're amongst the trees and you're looking through a series of leaves. So again, creating this really uh, simple but serene environment for children to learn. Of course, while we were thinking about the structural system, one of the most important things is to make sure we're creating a very robust building. Um, the school is uh, in a hurricane zone, as I'm sure anyone following the news is aware. There's a hurricane or two that goes basically on top of Haiti each year. And it's on an active fault line. Everyone remembers the earthquake in 2010, but there was also a smaller one just last week. So again, creating, making sure that the structure was integral to the design uh, helped us to create this robust uh, and long lasting school. At the same time, we were trying to balance uh, producing a very simple set of drawings with this goal of creating something a little bit more special. Um, so this sense of uh, you know, a, a recognizable uh, school that would stand out and make the, the school a little bit more special. La référence in French or in Haitian means the reference and the goal for the professors was actually to become a reference for the schools in the area. Um, so trying to, to both become iconic and very simple was, was on our minds throughout the design process, but also throughout the documentation process. And you can see that the roof trusses um, were one of the more challenging parts, but at the end of the day, um, this actually turned into one of the areas where we had the least issues. So, so here you can see um, we created these 
diagrams, these color-coded diagrams in order to be able to communicate um, both in three dimensions and referencing back, if I go back for a second, referencing back to these more technical drawings and dimension drawings. And that combination proved incredibly successful, um, especially, so one of the other challenges in Haiti, we actually drew the entire set, both structural and architectural in French at first and had a French or French speaking contractor. After having some issues, we ended up finding a new contractor who spoke only English. Uh, so straddling the language barriers between those, we had to, uh, update the set, but these color-coded drawings and diagrammatic drawings really helped, especially for subcontractor communication. So the GC's internal team was able to uh, read these drawings no matter what language they spoke. And you can see here uh, some of the metal fabrication on the right side. You have those big trusses. All of them are site welded, so they're actually putting them down on the ground and welding them on site. And on the left, some of the doors. Um, again, the clarity in the drawings helped us build what you can see here is a pretty complex set of, uh, of structural connections without a single problem in the roof. So that was, I would say, uh, probably are the highlight in terms of the success of communicating uh, our structural strategy. And uh, I will let Gregor take over and talk a little bit about construction and some of the challenges that we faced. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for having me here today. It's really great to uh, be able to come back and speak about this. Also, thanks for allowing my new daughter to join us. Um, she, as soon as I told her about this, she was just begging to attend. I think she asked me if she could have a summer internship at EOC in London this year, but um, I think she needs to improve her communication skills before that happens. Um, but anyways, she might uh, burst out with some noise, just in case uh, you're wondering what that background noise is, just, just as a warning. But yeah, so, Obviously, as Pierre mentioned, this was really quite an interesting and challenging project. Um, you know, EOC is obviously known for some of its, the, the amazing buildings that it engineers and is responsible for bringing into the world, um, particularly ones that are very complex and often, you know, um, with very large budgets. This was, was quite different, right? We had a very limited material palette. We didn't want to cart in materials that were foreign to the island or that the construction team and the locals weren't familiar working with. Similarly, they didn't have, we didn't want to come up with a design that relied on large pieces of equipment that couldn't be brought to site that weren't readily available. And so as you can see here, I mean, the foundations were dug largely by hand. Um, and so that was kind of just like one of the first eye-opening aspects of the project when we saw these initial site images of guys, you know, literally digging the foundations um, or digging, digging out the digging out for placement of the foundations by hand and doing compaction, you know, by hand or with, with relatively um, lightweight machinery. Similarly, this kind of like carried on through to you know, as they were developing and building the foundations, we were able to see, you know, this was a really this upper right image was really quite interesting to see that they actually are bending rebar by hand right and so once we saw that that kind of like informed things later on in the design and once we, we learned that's how they did things that really just informed us to how we should be approaching the design so trying to make sure that we don't make things overly complex that we really are very clear with communication and that we simply come up with you know a practical engineering solution that is also elegant and architecturally interesting um, so that's kind of what drove the entire methodology for the design process was really just making sure that what we were doing was practical, what we were doing was, you know, um, translatable so that we could communicate it to people that, you know, weren't necessarily familiar with Western or, you know, I guess U.S. standards of construction. Um, and our goal, in addition to getting the building built, was just ensuring that we taught the local construction crew about, you know, 
proper building practice, like ensuring that there's proper lap, lap lengths on all the rebar, doing slump tests to, to understand the quality of the concrete that's being poured, or in ensuring that there's like, you know, the proper sand is actually being used in the grout that's being poured into the, to the reinforced concrete, reinforced masonry uh, shear walls that, we, that were on the, on the project. One of the most, one of the critical aspects about the design of this project was what Pierre touched on, which is actually that this building uniquely, it's the only building I've ever worked on that had, was subject to hurricane force winds and subject to seismic site class D in, a, in ASC 7. So very large seismic forces. I think the, sh the short period spectral response was something like 1.5 Gs. Um, and also we had, you know, a, a base wind speed of 120 miles per hour, I think. So the building actually needed to be designed according to both. So for those of you familiar with designing in the United States, which is where I, where my background is, on the west coast of the United States, it's almost all seismic design. On the east coast, uh, for your lateral systems, it's largely all uh, hurricane design um, as the governing load cases. And there's really no case where both apply. Um, as kind of very heavy load cases on the building. Here, both did apply. So the roof design was largely governed by wind, but the lateral design of the building was governed by seismic because of the, because of the materials that are available. Almost all primary structure in Haiti is designed with masonry. And so we didn't really want to change that. We just wanted to do it, you know, what we thought was and what, what, how, what we thought was correctly, right? And so the building was designed as a special reinforced masonry shear wall. Um, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with what that means, what the, is that there's quite a lot of detailing requirements. And then the key thing that drives the design is actually the strain compatibility. So what you can see here is a diagram of a cross section through one of the piers. And these piers repeat all the way around the building. And they kind of are responsible for the, the lateral system in one of the one of the orthogonal directions. So in one orthogonal direction, we have these kind of piers, and then the other orthogonal direction, we have more traditional kind of like squat solid uh, concrete shear walls that were actually governed by shear. But these ones, as you can imagine, are governed by flexure. So to be to meet the criteria of a special reinforced concrete. Uh, special reinforced masonry shear wall, you have to meet this strain criteria. And what that means is that the steel in the, in the reinforcement under tension has to yield by a factor of four. So it has to go past its yield criterion and stretch four times uh, its, its yield strain. So before the concrete reason, reaches its design crushing um, uh, strain value. So you can see when the concrete or when the masonry reaches has a kind of a, a, a stress in it of 80% of the crushing strength of the masonry, at that same point you have to make sure that the yield, the tension, the, the farthest most tension reinforcing in that pier has yielded by a factor of four. And so that really ensures that during these seismic events you're stretching the steel, you're dissipating the energy associated with the event before you have this kind of more catastrophic failure of, of, um, of masonry crushing. So this was kind of this very key principle that we used that governed the entire design of all of these masonry perimeter shear walls. And as soon as we kind of landed on this balanced design that worked with the forces that we were seeing in the building model, this kind of was propagated throughout the design. And so it was used kind of everywhere, as you can see in the pictures in this repeated fashion. And that just made it made us and the building team a lot more comfortable that, you know, once we walked through a few of them, how they were built, made sure that they were being done correctly. We knew that it was going to be repeated throughout the building. Um, and because this is such a critical aspect of the building design, you know, from a lateral perspective, um, we were really happy with kind of how this turned out. So again, you can see the cross section through the shear walls. You know, as the, the, the forces are obviously decreasing as you get higher up in the building, increasing towards the base of the building as the shear compounds. Um, 
you have more reinforcement shown in the lower section of the piers and less reinforcement in the upper section of the piers. So you, it's this real balance with these special reinforced masonry shear walls. You want to make sure you're not over, over reinforcing. You want to make sure there's enough reinforcement in there to dissipate all the energy that the building's going to be exposed to. But you want to make sure that there's not so much reinforcement in there that the steel doesn't yield. That's really the last thing you want. So it's really about this balanced design um, and ensuring that you meet that criteria. So here you can actually see um, some work with you know, a large piece of equipment that was used. So we were fortunate. I think there were, Pierre, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that they said there were two uh, concrete pump trucks on the island of Haiti. And so it was difficult to kind of get their hands on them. So they had to schedule the pours very, very far in advance and basically kind of like had to keep that on, had to keep that those dates on schedule. We were fortunate to have that be able to come, but other than that, I'd say that is the only piece of large equipment that was used on the project was that pump truck. All the reinforcement kind of uh, was bent by hand and laid down, obviously, by hand. All the masonry shear walls were uh, built by hand. And all of the steel that was lifted into place was lifted by hand as well. And I'll touch on that as we, well, as we begin to talk about the roof. Um, all of the... Um, foundations were poured with the concrete that we had gotten through a design mix through them and we used a relatively conservative value um, um, based on the test values that came back and we just made sure that we got kind of proof tests on all the reinforcement that was used and made sure that kind of like all the design values were clearly communicated between us and the contractor and that the importance of the material quality you know it wasn't necessarily that the material had to be the, of the highest quality, of the highest grade, let's say. We weren't asking for, you know, uh, a higher tensile strength um, steel or, or anything like that. We were make, we just wanted to make sure that it was known and repeatable. That was really more important to us. So we said, yeah, we were fine designing with a relatively low strength concrete. We're fine designing with a relatively low yield steel. We just need to know that and know that wherever it's used in the design, it will be kind of repeated. And so that was something that was something that we kind of um, made very clear with the contracting team and they understood that. Because we can design really to, to anything, but um, it's really just making sure that what's actually used is reflected in the design. In terms of the um, shear walls themselves, here you can kind of see the reinforcing. So this is at the lower level. Um, there's a bit more reinforcement than at the upper level. Um, ensuring that our drawings reflected the reinforcement conditions is really critical and that it was very clearly laid out in the drawings how to, the spacing of the reinforcement, how to actually, um, you know, install the reinforcement with respect to the knockouts in the, mas in the masonry and also ensuring that all of the walls were grouted in flights, right? So that we didn't want to have them build a 12 foot section of wall and then go back and try to grout that. So, you know, we, we ensured that every few um, courses of masonry, they were going through and solidly grouting um, all of the walls. Um, that was a critical, critical aspect to the design, right? For, to, to, for both, um, you know, flexural strength and shear strength of, of, of the walls that were being designed. Here you can see kind of an image of just the completed shear walls around the, the, the piers around the perimeter of the building. And this is kind of what those, those reinforced piers look like when they were completed, plastered over and with the, uh, the kind of very common or door design that uh, Pierre mentioned installed. So once the primary building structure was built, uh, the, the, the main lateral system that is, um, the, the last part was kind of this intricate steel work that was designed for the roof. And Pierre and EOC and, and, spent, and us at EOC spent quite a bit of time rationalizing the roof geometry, making sure that we could break it out into pieces that were all small enough to be installed by hand so that, you know, a couple of guys could climb up the stairs with these and uh, sling them over the tops of the roof and then make all the connections, um, the primary connections between the trusses with bolts and that the vast majority of the connections were bearing connections on the shear walls. And then as, you'll, as Pierre touched on later, 
um, some of the kind of the girt, the, the purlins that go over the tops that join all the trusses together, um, those were actually welded, welded on site. Um, there were quite a few um, very, you know, skilled welders um, on the island. And that seemed to be something that, you know, they had um, a, a, a good grip on. And so we were excited to see that um, they were able to kind of, you know, easily, you know, work with all the um, design drawings to ensure that all the welded connections were done, done, done properly. Um, we did spend quite a bit of time ensuring working through this geometry and essentially the drawings that we use, that we developed were used as shop drawings, right? These drawings were printed out in the field and this is what they built off of, right? There were, there was no, um, you know, there was no subcontractor that was doing shop drawings. There was no, uh, there were no other subcontractors that were really preparing any document design documentation. So it was all kind of done in accordance with the architectural and structural drawings. So having clarity in these drawings as well as specificity was kind of, was very important. One thing that was critical to the design was ensuring that we actually used, we designed with the steel shapes that were available on the island. So they only had, they had a limited number of shapes. I think it was two inch by two inch or you know, 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter, 75 millimeter by 75 millimeter and 100 by 100 millimeter. Um, nothing really outside of that range. And so we had to base our design on that rather than say, oh, well, you know, you need, you need to use this. We want to use this special shape that um, we think is better for the design or more efficient or um, might be lighter weight, but for whatever reason, we just said, no, that's what's available. That's what you guys have. That's what you're used to. We're going to work with what you have and what is available to you rather than kind of forcing them to, to move outside of their comfort zone. Um, and also we thought that was going to just slow the project down and make everything a lot more painful than, than, it, than it needed to be. Here's a shot from the top of the roof with the, the main building structure install and a couple of pieces of steel laid down. These are actually kind of like transfer purlins to, to, to transfer sh um, in-plane shear from the roof diaphragm down into the, to the, to the shear walls below. Here you can see some, some, uh, an image of one of the steel workers actually cutting the steel on site, right? So this is kind of how all that work was done. A bunch of steel tubes were brought to the site essentially, and they worked with our drawings to get everything fit and cut to length and welded together on site and then hoisted, lifted into place um, by hand. I think in the background, in the upper left up there, you can probably actually see some, one of the trusses going in um, on its side. So here you can see them um, installing those trusses and each of these trusses were laid down and then in the bottom right hand corner, you can actually see one of those first purlins kind of being laid down on top of the trusses. Once the purlins were laid down, you're able to install the um, corrugated roof decking. And this is very common throughout all of Haiti. So again, we did not try to push them away from this or have them do anything different. We use this and simply on our side, it was really about ensuring that the fastener spacing was adequate for both in-plane shear, as well as kind of the seismic wind forces that we were expecting on the building. So it was a little bit different than they've been used to. You know, they used to kind of just typically laying down a, a and a um, screw spacing that they thought was common or adequate. And we specified probably a bit of a tighter spacing than they were used to, but we had justification behind all that. So obviously, as with any project, nothing goes perfectly. And on this project, there were definitely some opportunities, some areas where things, things, went, things went wrong and we had to kind of um, adapt and, and deal with those. So probably the biggest problem was at the balcony that kind of overhangs at the second level. So there's this, there was designed into the building was a cantilever balcony that spanned out about six feet from the main slab, from the, from the wall that was supporting the slab. And when the, the first phase was built, that the, the reinforcing was actually not, there was no top reinforcing installed. They just installed bottom reinforcing kind of in, in the direction of the span, right? So 
there was really no 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 steel to to accommodate the, the the tensile forces that were being generated at the top of the slab due to the hogging moment over the wall. Um, that, as you might imagine, became apparent pretty quickly once they took the shoring out. So, I mean, I guess immediately after they took the shoring out, we got some calls with, yeah, there's some pretty large cracks appearing um, parallel to the wall line. And, you know, pretty quickly we found out that actually through some images and through discussions with them, the drawings were read incorrectly and there was no top reinforcing installed in that direction. They thought it was meant to be on the bottom. So, you know, rather than ripping the slab out or doing anything drastic like that, we had a very sensible approach to the solution and we said, okay, we're gonna prop the slab back up and we're gonna install some um, columns, columns below and we're gonna check the performance of the slab with those new supports in place and ensure that the existing steel, the existing reinforcement that was put in is adequate um, for kind of the design that's that, that we're proposing. So that was what's shown here is that remediation. So you can see that those we put in some new HSS posts and for the subsequent phases, phase two, that kind of post idea carried around um, and the, the cantilever slab was abandoned. So um, I think it was just a lesson to you know both us and the contractor to make sure you double check everything, uh, make sure that everything's clearly communicated, and um, also you know more importantly to really not go at each other's throats or anything when a problem like this occurs, but really just work together to find a solution. Um, I think it worked out better for everyone in the end. That 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 was the approach we took. So here you can see phase one complete in the background and phase two in construction in the foreground. Here's some more shots of uh, phase two in construction and you can see them um, pouring the, the, the elevated slab here. Um, this was a picture, I guess, just, just of phase one. So this is phase one complete and you know, kids attending school, which is obviously great to see. Um, it's a really fulfilling project when you see, you know, a, a building having, you know, such a utilization, and, you know, value utility really um, being derived from it. Um, and so phase two would kind of come off to the right side of the page there in the following year. Um, Pierre, I'll pass it back to you. All right, uh, thanks Gregor. Um, so I'm just going to flip through a couple images, but uh, that essentially completes the presentation and we'll jump into some questions. Um, if How do we want to do the format question, Catherine? I think I'll... So, so, so I, 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 can, uh, I, I can help with that one. Um, yeah, I mean, super interesting presentation. It's kind of for kind of what is essentially quite a basic in inverted commas building it's actually very complicated and the all of the different things that you had to go through to actually um sort of get to that basic design is really um is really quite amazing in all those different considerations um i suppose megan um has put up a question megan's put up a question which sort of echoes one of my first thoughts as well was you know um how has this influenced how you've designed subsequent buildings so you know, sort of what uh, the approaches you've taken to this type of design, having to really break everything down into first principles and first parts, and really analyze how you put structures together. How has that sort of influenced your work going forward? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, and we learned a lot through the process. I think the most obvious thing that we keep mentioning is the importance of communication. Um, the, the fact that more communication is always beneficial to the successful outcome of the project. And I think the second thing I would say, at least architecturally, and I don't know if Gregor wants to answer afterwards, but architecturally, I think simplicity, right? The idea that there are all these different systems that are tied together. Um, and just going back to the bare bones and simplifying things is actually the best uh, solution at the end of the day for 99% of projects. There's no point in making our lives more difficult or in creating complexity where that's not necessary based on the program and the budget and those kinds of considerations. Yeah, 
It's um, you, you touched upon sort of communication there. I mean, Gregor, when you're talking about um, the slab going wrong and kind of not putting in the top reinforcement and only having the bottom reinforcement, it was. Um, it's really nice to hear that it was sort of then worked out for a solution collaboratively with the contractor. Sounds very different to some of the experiences, I think, you know, kind of over in the UK, perhaps, or even in the US. Um, what would you take away from that as being your sort of learnings from that and how to try and bring those situations back round again to make it that collaborative process? Because it sort of seems to be devolving into uh, descending into things, despite things like the NEC contract of collaborative nature and stuff. So what, what would be your takeaways from that? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously in today's day and age with litigation and um, large contracts and things like that, things can get, you know, out of hand pretty quickly sometimes. And I think this was certainly a better solution. Um, mm -hmm. And Pierre and I were both amenable to it. I mean, the number one thing was safety, right? So when there's no top reinforcing in a cantilever slab, that's a major safety concern. Um, and so the first thing was, okay, let's address the safety and then figure out how to make sure it works architecturally. And so I kind of obviously pushed all that part onto Pierre and then we came back to the drawing board and said, how can we make this work architecturally, structurally, and um, what's gonna be the least painful thing for the school, right? So, I mean, the number one goal in the end of this was to get the school open and to have a safe building. So that's, I think, one of the fortunate aspects of, you know, uh, working on this, one of these projects, on this project. Yeah, I, th I think that that's kind of a really nice kind of um, end thing that you have a goal and that kind of you don't lose sight of that goal. I think that sometimes gets lost in the message sometimes, doesn't it, on, in, when it comes down to contractual disputes. Um, Kassan has asked, um, how does the building perform during periods of torrential rain and high winds? Do the rooms remain dry? I mean, also, in addition to that, have, have there been any kind of earthquakes or hurricanes to kind of test the structure? Both great questions. Um, there were some high wind periods. I don't know if they technically qualified as hurricanes last summer. So phase one has definitely been very much tested. Uh, there was a smaller earthquake, I think I mentioned last week in the region, Ooh, which yeah. I think caused some shaking, nothing like 2010. Um, but again, uh, I, I don't think it's been tested to the capacity to which we designed it at this point in time. But uh, honestly, I hope that doesn't happen for the sake of, uh, of the rest of Haiti, which is not designed to these standards. Um, but the, um, Gregor can speak to the structural design of the roof, but it was, of course, uh, taken into account for uplift forces and hurricane force winds. You know, maybe the um, corrugated metal roofing would come off, but the rest of the structure would stay together. Um, Gregor, I don't know if you want to touch on that. Yeah, it was designed as a, uh, the roof was designed as like, as an open structure and ASC, we use ASC 7. So the building code that was referenced in Haiti at the time was the 2012 building code, which actually was, I think, the very first building code of Haiti. And that came about as a result of the 2010 earthquake. And that referenced ASE 705, I think. Um, and we designed the roof in, a, a, as an open structure with kind of uh, airflow going both above and beneath the, the roof surface. So there were, there were very large uplift forces. Again, um, that's where it came into kind of the, the primary thing being actually the design of that corrugated, the attachment of the corrugated roof to the purlins. So we just had a much tighter kind of fastener spacing than they were used to seeing, but that wasn't, that's not a, you know, a big deviation. And I think we kind of just explained the reason behind it and everyone was fine with it. Mm. And I imagine sort of the openness of the classrooms is kind of, it's far more helpful to have ventilation through in an open classroom than it is to necessarily be dry. So I imagine it gets, when it gets hot, it's, well, as in when it rains, it's still hot. So it still kind of dries up fairly quickly. So I, I imagine, but I don't, I don't know. So. Yeah, and that's, I think that's uh, to the, the second part of the question, which was about uh, wind driven rain into the classrooms. I do think there is, that that is an issue in any classroom where you cannot afford to put glass on every opening. Uh, the long cantilever of the roof 
if there's no wind, there's no issue whatsoever. The slabs are made to drain out. Um, but I think the the biggest the biggest thing there is you do end up having to make some compromises. We're not creating a, a watertight skin system here. It just isn't how, first of all, it wasn't in the budget and it is not how construction in Haiti is done. There's no air conditioning systems. So you need this natural ventilation much, much more than you need to uh, keep wind driven rain out of the building. And, and I, that's just one of those compromises that you have to, to make in the design process. And again, taking cues from what people are doing there. The rest of the schools in Haiti are, are done very similarly to this. Yeah, absolutely. I, su I suppose that then leads on to Camilla's question, because um, having this openness between the classrooms, you know, how do you deal with the noise between yes. and sort of um, uh, and the rain noise, perhaps as well? So that's, uh, that's again, a, a great question. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about this. Let me see if I can go back. So you can see here, um, most schools in Haiti, all of them have corrugated metal roofs. Uh, almost all of them are open at the top the way this school is. Uh, so the rain, the noises from the rain are a problem that occurs throughout. Um, but what we've done, the biggest issue that they have is, actually, is not actually that because it does not rain that often. Uh, and when it rains, it downpours. But the issue is not that, it's the, the noise from one classroom going to the other. And the, the, we actually very specifically stretched the classrooms along this L shape in order for the noise to dissipate out through the openings rather than in most schools in Haiti, you've got a hallway in the middle, a classroom on each side, they're open above and the noise just reverberates off the roof and goes into the other classroom. And it's essentially, it's deafening. In this case, you can see the roof very strategically uh, comes back down and hits a masonry wall above the classrooms so that each of the classroom is essentially its own, uh, its own isolated space and the noise tends to go out towards the, the open courtyard or the property line. So that's how we, we chose to minimize sound transmission between classes. Super. The, um, I'll just minimise that one. Pete's asking about site safety. Um, on uh, how how do you deal with the contractors and the construction team on site in terms of safety? I mean, you know, obviously it's not the same safety standards as we have over here, but you know, kind of how how was that introduced? Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question, and I think uh, a lot of it at the end of the day comes down to trust. Um, the contractor that we use, JSC Construction, is actually a company that was started by a uh, African-American man who married a Haitian woman and moved to Port-au-Prince. And so um, they, communication was a little bit easier and he obviously knew how to read drawings and, and had the same sort of standards for site safety. So in our case, uh, it was, very much based on trust and you can see some of the pictures where um, people are installing the the roof um, they definitely make my stomach flip but um that's you know they're they're doing that in haiti and and um i think as far as we know there were no no issues there so i suppose it all comes down to um I mean, there's only there's only so much you can do, I suppose, in these situations, but also making the design so simple and making the design something which um, is so um, known by the local construction team, kind of not venturing out of their comfort zone really helps in that, I imagine, um, in terms of sort of, you know, not designing something in, I, I don't know, just, I don't know carbon fiber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think keeping the, you know, the buildings only two stories tall, which are the professors and the founders of the school wanted something taller at the beginning and we just uh, weren't really comfortable with that, so. Absolutely. Um, so Patrick, um, Patrick has asked, in many situations, those problem, uh, 
project problem. Pro can't get my words out today. Project problems, if handled smartly, can be indeed very positive for the ongoing design process, even during the building phase. In my opinion, the unplanned, um, the unplanned for columns has really enhanced the final result. My congratulations. So that's a really nice comment in terms of kind of doing that. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and I, I tend to agree, actually, that columns uh, sort of create this, this courtyard and walkway where you you're still straddling, are you inside, outside? And there's all these different zones that, that come down into the landscape in the courtyard. So I actually agree. I think it was a, a positive compromise. Absolutely. I, I think it's a real triumph in terms of its um, architecture as well, considering all the sort of the things that you had to go through to be able to produce a building like this. Um, have you had any feedback from the contractor in terms of um, anything that they might have done in around Haiti using the same kind of construction but I'm learning from it uh, not not yet actually I mean the the construction finished in uh, October of, of this past year and we unfortunately have not been able to go back down to Haiti because of COVID and because of the uh, political challenges there so unfortunately I think until we sit down face to face with them we may not get that feedback but we know from phase one that there was this learning curve uh, and they they took that knowledge and phase two was flawless. So what, what was learned stayed with them through this project and we really hope that, that it stays with them beyond that. Absolutely. Um, I think we've probably answered the other two questions kind of in kind of in process of answering the other ones that we've done. Um, but as a sort of a final wrap up, what would you sort of give, I mean, this is kind of work which um, I think is hugely rewarding if you're an engineer or an architect to do. Um, certainly from seeing the faces of some of the children, it kind of looks extremely rewarding. Um, but, you know, if somebody was looking to get into this kind of work, A, how would they do that in your opinion? And B, sort of what are the benefits of doing it? And, you know, kind of, um, and do you think that sort of people should be doing this kind of work? As in, as standard, I suppose. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And I think, obviously, I could see O'Callaghan taking on these projects. Um, you know, I started Approach Gregor about this project in 2017, and I could O'Callaghan immediately took this project on internally. Um, I think these types of projects are critical. I think everyone deserves good design and good design, you know, without without forcing anything on anyone uh, or reinventing how they build uh, can lead to really beautiful, beautiful things. And this school is very beautiful and it's appreciated in the community. Um, so I think that's the most important thing is that we've, we've added something to the community that will be long lasting, um, a sense of safety. So that's, that is, uh, I, th I think it's crucial that people get involved. To get involved, you know, this, this project was built from a, uh, a small organization in Princeton that my, my family's been involved with for a long time. And I think if you enter those conversations and you start talking to nonprofits, uh, they will take you on. You know, they, they can use the help and uh, offer yourself up to do it. It's all coming full circle with the communication again, basically. It's all about communication, yeah. all about communication. Well, I think that's probably, um, I don't know if Gregor wants to add anything um, at the last second. I, I think um, you've done absolutely amazingly with your multitasking there, Gregor, absolutely super. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> um, super, well, I wish, um, I wish, I wish uh, George's all the best in terms of, um, yeah, hope, hope you have a smooth bedtime. And, um, I'll wrap things up for the evening. Uh, just to remind you that next week we have the HP Allen Center for our next webinar at 5 p.m. And uh, that's about um, the building that we built for Keeble College, Oxford. And it was about retaining um, one of the listed buildings on the site and building a rather large basement underneath it and sort of the 
things that came with the facilitation of building this basement um, and it appeared to float so that's a very um, exciting webinar um, for next week so please join us for that and also look forward to the other two which are coming up and the bonus ones including the sky pool um, that's all from me have a lovely evening or afternoon if you're in the us um, a huge thanks again for joining us both gregor and pierre um, it's been fantastic to hear about the project and um, I will uh, wish you all a lovely evening. Uh, take care and we'll see you Thank later you. on. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye.